In this video, we describe how to dissect the anterior abdominal wall. This work was created by Dr. Carlos Andres suarez -Kian and Dr. Joel Valensky. Dr. suarez -Kian is a narrator of this video. The musculature of the anterior abdominal wall is essential for defecation and parturition and also to prevent the occurrence of inguinal hernias. Let's start the dissection of the anterior abdominal wall. It is customary for clinicians to divide the anterior abdominal wall into four quadrants, as shown in the image. These quadrants include the right and left upper quadrants and the lower right and left lower quadrants. A horizontal line through the umbilicus divides the wall into the upper and lower parts, and the midline divides it into left and right parts. Thus, in a hospital report on a patient, you might read that the patient was admitted with severe RLQ pain, that is, right lower quadrant pain. Such a report would be consistent with appendicitis. The dissection begins by making a sagittal and a horizontal skin incision, as we have done in this female cadaver, that corresponds to the clinical divisions of the abdomen into the four quadrants. My goal now is to quickly go over the overall dissection in one cadaver, then focus on specific components of the anterior abdominal wall to demonstrate specifically clinically relevant structures. Reflection of the skin of the abdomen reveals a typically fatty superficial fascia. Technically, this fascia is divided into a fatty superficial layer and a deeper membranous layer that is more prevalent inferior to the umbilicus. The fatty layer is referred to as campers fascia and the membranous layer is scarpas, albeit it is difficult to discern in the image. We will see it again shortly. Nevertheless, the membranous layer is clinically significant because it will retain sutures following an abdominal incision. Once the superficial fascia is removed, the external oblique muscle and its aponeuroses become apparent. The aponeuroses of the abdominal muscles are basically broad tendons of insertion for these muscles. The lower border of the external oblique aponeuroses forms the inguinal ligament, which separates the abdominal wall from the thigh. Medially, and slightly superior to the inguinal ligament, there is a defect in the external oblique aponeurosis, and there are similar defects in the underlying abdominal wall muscles. These defects form a canal through the abdominal wall for the spermatic cord in the male and the round ligament of the uterus in women. This canal is referred to as the inguinal canal. The opening in the external oblique aponeurosis is referred to as a superficial inguinal ring. The inguinal canal can allow abdominal viscera to extrude through the superficial ring, resulting in an inguinal hernia. Because the canal is much larger in men than in women, inguinal hernias are much more common in men than in women. Later in the video, we'll present additional images of this region. The broad aponeurosis of the anterior abdominal muscles meet at the midline and encase a muscle, the rectus abdominis. This area of the aponeurosis is termed the rectus abdominis sheath. And precisely at the midline, no nerves or vessels cross the rectus sheath, and the aponeurosis appears quite white at this point. This is termed the linea alba, or white line, and represents a safe area where surgeons could incise the anterior abdominal wall from the pubic symphysis to the siphoid without risking injury to the nerves that supply the anterior abdominal wall muscles. While such an incision and subsequent scarring would be unsightly, it would not leave the anterior abdominal wall weakened, as would happen if the anterior abdominal wall muscles were denervated by a perpendicular incision lateral to the linea alba. Underlying the external oblique is the internal oblique muscle and its aponeurosis. Note that the fibers of the internal oblique are oriented superomedially 
from the bottom to top, whereas the fibers of the external oblique are oriented superomedially from top to bottom. This difference in fiber orientation is clearly demonstrated in this image of a different cadaver dissection. In the top panel, the fiber orientation of the external oblique muscle is illustrated, whereas in the bottom panel, the perpendicular orientation of the muscle fibers of the internal oblique to those of the external oblique muscles are observed after partially reflecting the latter. The transversus abdominis muscle is the third broad muscle of the anterior abdominal wall. It underlies the internal oblique and has fibers that mostly go transversely. So the abdominal wall of the abdomen has three broad muscles that are separated by layers of fat. Think for a minute of a breakfast food that has a similar arrangement. Yes, bacon. Bacon comes from pork bellies with a similar arrangement in the musculature. Also observed in the image now is the rectus abdominis muscle. This central muscle of the abdominal wall is contained with the aponeurosis of the oblique and transversus muscles, the aforementioned rectus sheath. Note the tendinous intersections present in the rectus abdominis. These tendinous intersections are what gives rise to the washboard abs in those who exercise this muscle. Further, the lateral margin of the muscle is referred to as the linea semilunaris. It can be observed on the surface of athletes. Reflection of the rectus abdominis reveals the posterior rectus sheath and the inferior epigastric artery, which is an important landmark when surgeons are repairing an inguinal hernia. We will say more about the posterior rectus sheath and the additional layers forming the anterior abdominal wall shortly. This now concludes a general survey of the anterior abdominal wall. Let's not go into some details relevant to the practice of medicine. Let's now focus our attention again on the lower right quadrant. And here we can truly observe the two distinct layers of the superficial fascia, the fatty layer of campers and the membranous layer of scarpa. Realize that the membranous layer is even more prominent in the living and easy to discern from the fatty layer. After completely removing the superficial fascia, we can now see the external oblique muscle and its aponeurosis and its inferior border, the inguinal ligament. Realize that the inguinal ligament is attached to the deep fascia of the thigh, the fascia lata. The segregation of these two compartments by the inguinal ligament and the fascia lata helps explain the distribution of urine in cases where the urethra is ruptured and urine extravasates. Urine will never diffuse into the thigh, whereas it can be distributed deep to the skin and superficial to the external oblique aponeurosis of the abdomen. We now clearly see the superficial inguinal ring and the passage of the spermatic cord through the ring. Accompanying the cord is a nerve, the ilioinguinal nerve. At this point, the goal of the dissection is to continue the incision into the scrotum to expose the testis and its associated structures. Cutting through the various layers of the spermatic cord ultimately exposes the testis encased in its tunica albuginea, the tough fibrous capsule. Recall from embryology that the testis develops in the abdomen and that it must exit the abdomen in order for sperm to become fertile. Sperm will not gain fertility at body temperature. As the testis exits the abdomen via the inguinal canal, it takes with it various layers of fascia from each of the muscles that make up the anterior abdominal wall. The outer layer will be the external spermatic fascia from the external oblique. The inner layer, the tunica vaginalis, the peritoneal layer.
Draped in the testis is the epididymis, a coiled tube that stores mature sperm. Sperm are produced in the testis, but pass through the epididymis to become fertile, a process that lasts approximately eight to nine days in the human. Sperm are ejaculated from the tail of the epididymis at orgasm, not the testis. Reflecting the external oblique exposes the second muscle layer of the anterior abdominal wall, the internal oblique. And now you can see that the internal oblique muscle takes its origin from approximately two-thirds of the inguinal ligament. In the male, small fibers arise from the internal oblique muscle and travel to the spermatic cord. These are known as the cremaster muscles and are responsible for the cremasteric reflex. Females do not possess a cremaster muscle. Reflecting the internal oblique reveals the last muscle layer, the transversus abdominis. Oftentimes, the internal oblique and transversus muscles are fused and the separation is not possible to perform. Here, the transversus is particularly robust. The transversus muscle also takes its origin from the inguinal ligament. Reflection of the internal oblique allows us to determine the path of the nerves that innervate the muscles of the anterior abdominal wall. These nerves travel between the transversus abdominis and the internal oblique, similar to the intercostal nerves that travel between the innermost and intermediate muscle layer of the thoracic wall. A clear cylinder has now been placed in the approximate location of the inguinal canal to demonstrate the path taken by the spermatic cord from whence it leaves the abdominal cavity by way of the deep inguinal ring to exit by the superficial inguinal ring to then enter the scrotum. Removal of the transversus abdominis finally allows us to observe the fascia transversalis, extraperitoneal fat, and the peritoneal layers of the anterior abdominal wall. Realize that although these exist as separate layers, in the image, this separation cannot be discerned. We also note the deep inguinal ring, a defect in the fascia transversalis that allows for the spermatic cord to enter the peritoneal cavity. It is through here that a piece of intestine may exit the peritoneal cavity as a hernia. Note as well the important relationship of the deep inguinal ring to the inferior epigastric artery. If the hernia escapes the abdomen via the deep inguinal ring, shown by the blue arrows, then it enters the inguinal canal that we just described in the previous images and it is known as an indirect inguinal hernia. The neck of the hernia is located lateral to the inferior epigastric artery. In contrast, if the hernia just bulges out medial to the inferior epigastric artery, orange arrows, it is known as a direct inguinal hernia. Realize that it will be impossible to tell just by looking at the hernia from the outside whether it's a direct or indirect since both will be indistinguishable in appearance. However, the membrane covering of the two types of hernias will be quite different. As an aside, this latter type of hernia is described as a weakness or an outpocketing of Hesselbach's triangle. The triangle is defined as the lateral border of the rectus sheath, the linea semilunaris that we described earlier, the lower portion of the inguinal ligament, and the inferior epigastric artery. The triangle is generally described when the anterior abdominal wall is reflected and you can examine the triangle from its posterior view. Before leaving the inguinal region, I would like to emphasize that the female exhibits an identical inguinal canal that is indistinct from that of the male. The only difference is that instead of a spermatic cord, the content of the canal is the round ligament of the uterus that stretches from the uterus to the labia majora. The round ligament provides lateral support for the uterus. It is one of the ligament sets that helps keep the uterus in the midline at all times.
even when the females are running. Also, females too can develop erect and indirect inguinal hernias, although compare the size of the round ligament to that of the spermatic cord. Realize that because the round ligament is smaller, the inguinal canal in the female tends to be smaller than in the male. Thus, indirect inguinal hernias are less likely to occur in the female. Finally, following a hysterectomy, the round ligament tends to wither away. This is one of the reasons that the round ligament can be difficult to find in a dissection. The last topic to cover regarding the anterior abdominal wall is the rectus sheath. As we mentioned briefly earlier, it is simply the aponeurotic tendons of the oblique and transversus muscles that meet the contralateral aponeurosis and encase the rectus abdominis muscle. On the left is another dissection of the external oblique muscle, and on the right, the anterior abdominal wall and crust section is demonstrated. If we label the layers of the cross section, as before, we start with skin and superficial fascia and the aponeurosis and muscle of the external oblique. Next, we encounter the aponeurosis of the internal oblique. However, this aponeurosis splits to envelop the rectus abdominis. Hence, the aponeurosis of the internal oblique is supposed on both surfaces of the rectus abdominis muscle, helping to form both the anterior and the posterior rectus sheaths. Reflecting the internal oblique reveals the last layer of aponeurosis belonging to the transversus abdominis. And in this image too, the anterior rectus sheath has been removed to expose the rectus abdominis. After reflecting the rectus abdominis muscle, we can examine the posterior rectus sheath. It is important to understand that the posterior rectus sheath does not extend from the thoracic cage to the pelvis as does the anterior rectus sheath. Rather, it ends midway between the umbilicus and the pubic symphysis at a point called the arcuate line. It is at this point that the inferior epigastric artery enters the rectus sheath. We can now finish describing the layers of the anterior abdominal wall as the fascia transversalis, extraperitoneal fat, and finally, the peritoneum. And while these cannot be distinguished in the image, again, we emphasize that they are present and are likely to require independent suturing after abdominal surgery to ensure that the sutures made after an abdominal incision does not undergo dehiscence. This now concludes the first video of the abdomen, the anterior abdominal wall.